he was just a slip in the finger. You sent the wrong email to the wrong Jim. But in Jim's hands... There are thousands of searches um, on the topic of recalling an email every month, um, if, you, if you look at the stats online. Um, and I suspect the reason for that is that we've all inadvertently sent something to the wrong person. Um, and I'm not certain that everyone is familiar with what techniques they can employ to try and protect themselves against that inadvertent accident, uh, slip of the finger. Um, Partly because I suspect it's not an easy thing to invoke. Uh, yeah, that that's a revocation process with mail systems. Um, so I think there's a, probably a, a training gap there, and also because the tools that are out there don't really solve the problem very eloquently. The subject of data in a business is really important. Um, I.e who has access to what data, particularly if it's sensitive data. Um, in the financial services, the legal markets, accountancy, pre-will everything that professional advisors touch is sensitive. It's you know personal to the individuals or the companies with whom they are or for whom they are acting. Um, and they, as individual practitioners, are responsible for that data, as are the directors of that company. And in particular, I guess, if you're, um, you know, an ISO 27001 company or a data protection officer, well, you'll be even more acutely aware of your responsibilities around data. But ultimately, in the context of email, we are all responsible for ensuring that the data that we're pushing around is safeguarded. So one of the biggest questions we are often asked is what is sensitive data? And it's and it's a whole subject in its own right. But I guess if you look at a piece of information about a customer and you think, do you know what? If that was me, I wouldn't want that bit of data shared or those two pieces of data shared together because they could compromise me or that information might be, you know, or valuable in someone's hands in a in a um, in a criminal way, you're pretty well definitely going to be looking at sensitive data. Um, and as I say, for most professional services companies, that's most of the information we're dealing with day to day. So there are industrial scale businesses across the globe that are entirely focused upon data, on putting together the jigsaw pieces that in each individual element, each individual piece may not in itself look sensitive, but when combined with another piece of data, create a picture and create an opportunity for a cyber criminal to conduct fraud or, or mimic your identity or all those horrible things we all think about. So I think what's really important when we're thinking about data, uh, where it lives, how we transmit it, how we deal with it, is not to look at it in isolation because although that piece of data you're transmitting may look relatively innocuous. You start combining it with other information, and I'm afraid it uh, it can paint a bleak picture for for, uh, for whomever is the owner of that data. In the UK, we have a real um, culture of our home is our castle. Um, you know, we prolific home buyers, and it's quite natural to want to put a moat around our castles to protect us from people that might want to be hostile towards us. And if, in fact, most of the things that companies consider in the context of cybersecurity are about that moat, stopping people getting in and penetrating our systems. But there are other vectors. That's what, you know, you really hear that phrase banded around. There are other security issues that a company needs to think about. And it needs to also help the people within its business to understand the risks associated with the way that they deal with data in their transmissions out of the company, not just, you know, those cyber criminals trying to break down the moats or climb across the moats or whichever way you want to put it. Um, so I think, I think it's really important not to forget that when you're dealing with cybersecurity, 
there are organizations that are looking in on the outbound communications that you are dealing with every day as an opportunity for fraud. So if you send something inadvertently to the wrong person, uh, you might not necessarily believe there's any damage being done. There's actually an obligation under ICO legislation to advise when you push the data of, a, of one party you know, uh, to, to someone else uh, inadvertently. Um, now, that damage, you know, may be limited because you do know the person to whom you've sent something incorrectly. You know, you, you know, it was just a slip in the finger. You sent the wrong email to the wrong gym. But in Jim's hands, one, that is a contravention of the of the ICO regs. But but also, what about if the second gym knows the first and you just give away the fact that they've got a bank account and an investment or a pension or that uh, there's something personal about their health? about, you know, I mean, it, the, the list is endless. So I think it's really, really important just to be very respectful about how you protect those boundaries. So if I'm using um, a normal email system um, and I've made that horrible gut-wrenching uh, error of sending something very sensitive to the wrong person, um, the best I can do is invoke uh, a recall. I can ask the person to whom I've written incorrectly, yeah, please delete that email and don't read it. Of course, I don't know if they have deleted it. Um, uh, and I don't know, as importantly, if they've already read the information. And therefore, I'm forced to report that as a data incident, um, unfortunately. Of course, if I use MailLock, then I can revoke access. I can check and see if the email has been read. And of course, if it hasn't, I can immediately revoke, safe in the knowledge that no data has been uh, uh, read by the wrong party, the wrong party that are not required to therefore enter into this sort of you know obligation of reporting it as an incident. And I can just get on with the job of sending the information to the right person. So I that very rarely actually see people need to exercise revoke. When you need it, you need it, and you need it instantly, and it's there. But the reason that they shouldn't really have to exercise it, I hope very often, is because the system affords the user the ability to authenticate their intended party uh, and prevent them from accessing any information until they've authenticated themselves in the first place. Um, so I'm pleased to say it's a bit of a double whammy, really, but nonetheless... Quite a nice, uh, a nice safety blanket. If you have unfortunately been party to, in, you know, been the, the instigator of a data uh, breach through sending an email to the wrong person, um, the repercussions can be can come in all sorts of forms. Of course, there's the there's the embarrassment really factor, the professionalism uh, impact of the fact that the person to whom you're communicating has just received something that's nothing to do with them. If they have to be other client, that's not great um, in that context. Of course, you're required to report that um, data incident to the data regulator, the ICO. Um, the reputational and financial damage can be extraordinary. I mean, we've all seen incidents like this where businesses have been impacted extraordinarily by the reputational impact of them not acting within the confines of our regulators' requirements. You know, the news headlines when, you know, a business has leaked my data or in some cases, many, many clients' data. Um, and of course, the financial impact that the fines that can be imposed by our regulator are pretty hefty these days um, as a consequence of things like GDPR. Um, but I guess the, the, the media impact is just that whole professionalism piece and whether you're credible any longer with your customers um, if you expose not just their data but someone else's data to them, ironically. <laughs>